Students, we are going to learn something new in this class, that is class 4. First, I would like to have some recap of what we have done so far. As you know, we have talked much about natural and man-made nanomaterials. And then at the end of the last lecture, I talked about some classification and as well as examples from that. And finally, I talked about something about carbon-based nanomaterials. So let us first discuss about these aspects, then we will go ahead with other things. As you know, this is something which I will again and again tell you that nanomaterial is something which is a material with one of its dimensions in the nanometric design or nanoscale. What is that? That is the size ranging from 1 to 100 nanometers. So you can have nano objects, nanoparticles, and nanoplates, fiber, tubes, rods, wire, even quantum dots. But remember these aspects. I have been telling you again and again every lecture. So this is something which students likely to forget. Instead of nanometers, they will add micrometers. So that's why the size ranges, size ranges from 1 to 100 nanometers is very important. So as you know, there are naturally available nanomaterials like you have virus which is going on for the last six months. Then you can have you know volcanic smoke containing nanomaterials. You can also have nanomaterials in natural world like in tree leaves in case of uh, you know other nanostructures I have discussed for the different animals actually what have talked about it okay like silk a spider, fine. Then there are hundreds, thousands of different types of, or not hundred, thousands maybe, of different types of man-made nanomaterials. We can burn some coal or something, we can produce fine scale particles which are dangerous for health, like pollutions. Then you can have also fracti exhaust, you can have exhaust from the automobile, and you can even create in the lab, right. So you can have different types of nanomaterials we discussed. Man-made nanomaterials, important application is I talked about is painting, using gold, silver, especially gold nanomaterials in, you know, you can think about this as thousands of thousands of years ago, humans started using. And then I talked about this, you know, cup or the mug actually, which is been given to uh, Byzantine king. And then I talked about something about Mayans uh, and their paintings, the blue color, which I discussed about that, the blue formula in their paintings is basically because of nano structure clay. Uh, not only that, some of the Mayans painting also have gold nanoparticles, which you have seen it, or sorry, silicon dioxide nanoparticles present in that. Oh, well, you know, uh, these, you know, the, for the conservation of the paintings or script, text, you can use nanomaterials also like clay, okay, and that can go inside and that protect these kind of things. So nanomaterials emerge in our life as an important aspect. You can have nanomaterial in every sector of life. That's why you need to know about it. And you know Moore's law is almost reaching its lower limit. You can you you can no longer put transistors so smaller than about say 10 nanometers or so. It is impossible now to go down this limit. So we are slowly reaching that. You can see 2030 is what is the predicted limit by X-ray lithography. And so we have gone to that. So therefore we need to go to now atomic scale lithography that is in not yet achieved. So that's something which is you need to know. But on the other hand, nanomaterials actually, to understand nanomaterials, you need to understand the interface between chemistry, physics, biology, and materials. That's why the difficulty comes in picture for most of us. So we need to learn a lot of new things, 
how all these subjects are making an interplay in determining this materials world is something which is new to all of us. Okay, so now let us come back to the discussion which you are going to do. So that must be a way to classify nanomaterials, right? Because we have seen plethora of nanomaterials available in the natural world and man-made world. But if you have to classify them, if you have to categorize them, how are you going to do? The best way of doing is by using a concept called dimensions, which I have discussed in the last lecture. What is that dimension? Well, it means in a nanomaterial, it indicates the number of dimensions which number of basically in dimensions in x, y, z, if you consider 3 x, x is x, y, z, the number of dimensions which are not in nanometric design, right, which are beyond, whose dimension is beyond 100 nanometers, okay, that is what is the way we define dimensions. So, that means if it is zero dimensions, that means out of x, y, z, three important three dimensional dimensions, all of them are in the nanometric scale, that is what is, that is nothing but a nanoparticle. Then one dimensional means one of the dimensions are not in nanometric region, right. Two dimension means two of the dimensions are non nanometric region, three dimension means all three are non nanometric regimes. So, you must be surprised why do you call them as a nanomaterial? We will discuss more detail about that. First, let us start from zero dimension, that is what is important. So, I hope you understood it, right. The important aspect is this numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, this, this numbers as you go along this direction, these numbers, they indicate the dimensions out of 3 x, y, z which is not in nanometric scale, that is what it is. So, that is you must remember. So, you know that is what is written classification is mostly based on number of dimensions which are not confined to nanometric or nanoscale design, okay. So, 0, 1, 2, 3. Now, what is zero dimensions? Materials in higher in all the dimension measured within nanoscale, all the dimensions x, y, z they are called zero dimensional, that is like a nanoparticle. But you have to understand, it can be amorphous or crystalline, it need not be only crystalline materials, it can be single crystalline or polycrystalline, it can be composed of single elements or multi elements, it can have different shapes and forms, it can exhibit individuality or incorporate in a matrix, in a something which these particles can be incorporated, it can be obviously metallic, ceramic or polymeric, anything is possible. Well, let us see that this is the electron micrograph of ZrO2 that is zirconium nanoparticles powder. See, you can see some of these particles, although image is not very distinct and clear. This picture is again taken from the book of Bolath. Okay. Hope you have seen the book already or you have not seen the book Dieter Bolath. This is taken by, taken from that. So, this indicates there are a lot of zirconium oxide nanoparticles which are dimensional less than 100 nanometers, but because the nanoparticle mostly spherical, so it has only one dimension that is the diameter of the nanoparticle in the sphere, that is in nanometric regime. So, you do not need to bother about other two dimensions like theta and phi, we do not care about in, in, in the determining the dimensions of nanoparticle of those aspects. Well, you can also have other things like nanoparticles of hematite Fe2O3, right. You can see that hematite crystals, they are less than about 100 nanometers small or big. You can also have amorphous like nanomaterials, amorphous crystals you can see that. So, you can have both crystalline amorphous nanomaterials present. So, therefore, all of these are zero dimension nanoparticles. Now, let us talk about one dimension nanoparticles. So, what are these one dimension nanoparticles? Well, one dimension nanoparticles are, if one of the dimensions are outside the nanoscale. So, you should understand if one of the dimension is outside the nanoscale, that means one of the dimension can be much longer than the other two dimensions, what you can get is a needle like needle shaped crystals, okay. 
So like nanotubes, nanorods, nanowires, they are all one dimensional. It can be also again amorphous crystalline or other all parameter like single crystalline, polycrystalline, chemically pure or impure. They can be stand alone or putting on a substrate and obviously metallic ceramics and a polymeric. Give me an example, okay. Let us look at Z and O nanorods. Okay, these are again taken from Dieter Borlaug. Okay, so this is a secondary electron image of zinc oxide nanorod. Zinc oxide is very important spin tonic materials. It has a lot of dope dim oxide, but it is also has a lot of interesting properties, multi properties, functionality. So they are actually rods. You can see. So if you look at rods, this is like like a this kind of things. So this dimension Z is not a nanometric scale. They are much longer than 100 nanometers. On the other hand, this dimension, diameter, is in nanometric cuisine. So, immogolite nanotubes also comes in this picture. Okay, they are also very long, needle-like. So, you understand that. Now, let us look at 2D nanometers. What are they? Two of the dimensions are not confined to nanoscale. Only one, that is, suppose either of x, y, z, only one is confined to nanoscale. And they obviously they look like a plate. Did you understand that? They look like a plate. Two dimensional nanometers will be thin films on a substrate, nano layers, nano coatings, even other things also. Give an example of silicon nitride coatings on a copper substrate, you can see that. Or you have a platinum and FET, FETOs coating on the copper substrate. So they are all very thin layers, okay, less than nanometers. 100 nanometer thickness. To give you some more aspect, let us look at gold platelets. You can see hexagonal separate gold platelets. Okay. Their uh, only thickness is less than 100 nanometers, but other dimensions, even these dimensions, they are pretty big. This is at 0.0 nanometers, they are also like that. So, that is true. Not only that, if you look at copper fluoride, CuFe204. They are also like that. You can see the picture is 100 nanometers. So that means these dimensions are much, much bigger than 100 nanometers. Okay, but thickness is less than 100 nanometers. So this is again also taken from Dieter Olaf books. Oops. Okay, 3D nanomaterial, that is where the most of the discussions will concentrate. Bulk nanomaterials are 3D nanomaterials. Why? Because these materials dimensions x, y, z, they are not confined to nanoscale any dimensions. Okay. Material process in nanocrystalline structure, okay, in terms of it can have multiple elements of nanocrystalline materials. Even with respect to the features. 3 nanomaterials can contain dispersion nanoparticles, bundles of nanowires, nanotubes, or even nano layers. We will see that, multi nano layers, we will see that actually. So, they are nanomaterials because of their internal structures, okay? not external dimensions. That is what you must remember. Let us look at the grains actually. If you look at these grains, very clearly you can see these grains are pretty big in 2D as well as 3D. I am showing you. Okay? So, but it has something inside these grains. They may be poor or they may be something else. Nonetheless, their dimensions, if they are less than 100 nanometers, then we call them as a nano materials, but they are 3D. All the grains are bigger than 100 nanometers, but they are called 3 nanomaterials. This is you, something which you must remember that, because this is something which is very difficult to understand or take in the minds. Okay? So, if I have to put everything together, 0 d means all the dimension x, y, z are in nanometric regime, 1 d means only 2, 2 d means only 1 and 3 d means none. Right? That is why 3 d does not come into picture of that. Different shapes are also shown. You can see 1 d has a rod like shapes, needle like shapes, 2 d has a plate like things, 0 d has a particle shape and 3 d is not actually a nanomaterial. Well, uh, you know in terms of structural things, let us also discuss something like this. 
So actually, if we deposit a thin plane on a substrate and thickness of a thin plane is less than 100 nanometers, we call them a nanostructure, one dimensional nanostructure materials. Obviously, other two dimensions, Z and sorry, Y and X can be very, very large, right. So, but even within the, the now comes to the point. Suppose I have this thin plimps on the substrate. You can see that here. Now, then I look at the grain structure of these thin plimps. If the grain structure can be nanocrystalline or microcrystalline. If the thickness of this thin film is less than 100 nanometers, it does not matter whether the grain structure is nanocrystalline or microcrystalline, we have to call them as a nanomaterial. Let us suppose thickness is more than 100 nanometers, okay. Then none of the dimensions of these in nanocrystalline design or nanoscale, but still we can call the material nanomaterial if the grain structure inside this thin film is nanocrystalline. Remember this, this is very important, right. So, we need to know the internal structure of these thin films to say that it is a nano or not nano. You can also have multiple layers instead of single layers, right. Suppose you have a this structure substrate and then you put a multiple layers and each layer is thickness is less than 100 nanometers. Then we call them as nanomaterials. Now, within each layer you have grain structure that can also be microcrystalline or nanocrystalline depending on how you deposit that. So, my question is this to you, how many different ways you can create this kind of nanostructures? Please do it yourself and find it out. That is very important exercise that will give you a thought process clear, okay. Otherwise, you will forget it very easily. That is very uh, something which you have to remember and then in exams you may not be able to put it. So, microcrystalline structure you see you have a substrate thick flame less than more than 100 nanometers microcrystalline grains correct. You have a substrate multiple layers each layer has nanocrystalline grains. You have a substrate multiple layers each layer is thickness is less than 100 nanometers, but the grain structure is microcrystalline. Different different combinations you can do it and see it at your own disposal, right. That is not easy. Well, to give examples of better quality pictures, okay, this is all taken from again the book by uh, Mike S. B. and others. So, you can see that uh, this is a nanoparticle, mostly gold, and its dimension is less than 100 nanometer because this is 2 nanometers. So, you must be able to read now this is a linear scale. You can measure this scale and measure the dimensions of the particle. You can also have 2D like this one which is basically nano rod you can see that, but bent and other things happen that is ok, but it is bent. So, it is very 1D not 2D. One of the dimension is long, the other two dimensions are basically nanometric scale. You can also have thin film I have already shown you, no need to discuss about it or you can have grain structures which I have shown you, this is 3D nanomaterials. Now, as I told you, 3D nanomaterials can be created in many ways. Let us see some of the examples of that, taken both from the book of Michael S. P. and as well as from Dieter Bolat. See, you can have a matrix whose grains are very big, let us say matrix with a large micron size grain and then you can put reinforcement particles like precipitates in a matrix and aluminum copper alloy I gave you the example, do not forget that, that is a classic example in metallurgy. Then you have a matrix reinforced with nanotubes, nano wires, you can also have laminates, the thickness of each layer is less than 100 nanometers, then you can create a matrix, you create a material, 3D material. Ah, you can also have sandwiches, very simple like sandwich means two pieces of bread in which you have something of the meat or vegetarian food, right. So, same thing can be done also, you can put two pieces of same material within each one other material can be kept and one of the dimensions of these materials can be nanometric, then you can call them nanomaterial, right. So, these materials are basically formed by two or more materials, not a single material and they have this each material has distinct material property. And when you put them together, they actually act together. 
synergistically to create properties that cannot be achieved by a single material. Matrix of nanometer composites can be polymeric, metallic or ceramics has dimensions obviously more than nanoscale, but mostly in a reinforcing phase will be at nanoscale. That is something we should remember. So, by putting different reinforcing phase, you can create these 3D nanostructure materials in many, many, many different ways. Let us see that. There are three basic types of nanocomposites. Okay. One is you put zero dimension particle in a matrix, that is A, this is taken for Dieter Wola. Okay, you can see that. You can also have one dimensional nanocomposite, comes of nanotubes or nanowires, this will be the second matrix, you can see that. Or you can have two dimensional nanocomposite built the stacks of thin film. Okay, you can see one phase and second phase, the stack on each other. So, you know very interestingly, this is something which uh, was discovered, but which was uh, there in the you know, earlier world. I will tell you who has done that. As you know, the oldest and most important type of nanocomposite is which has more or less spherical nanoparticles, spherical gold nanoparticle actually. Example is gold ruby glass. This is gold ruby glass. What is that? In ruby matrix you are putting spherical gold part nanoparticles, well ordered. Can you imagine this material is made by a made in you know long back in 7th century BC okay, by Asarian. And they actually mastered the art. Later on it was made in Germany also in 17th century. But look at it, 7th century BC somebody is making such a kind of nanomaterials is really a masterpiece. Well, as you know it is a goal in ruby glass they may not interact okay, or that means they may not interpret each other, there will be no diffusion. If there is a problem of diffusion happening, you can also put a diffusion barrier layer around it, which is uh, you know widely used, diffusion barrier surrounds each nanoparticles and it is required if nanoparticles matrix are mutually soluble, that is possible actually. You can put a polymeric layer on the metallic nanoparticle before you embed in a metallic matrix, because most of the many metals they actually have good solubility each other. This is done actually, but then the stability of a nanoparticle will depend on stability of this layer which you are putting around it. But Assyrians are very, very clever. They put gold in ruby glass, there is no solid solubility between ruby and the gold. And that was a classic material which can be used for many, many purposes. Well, uh, so that is something which you should know, okay, and uh, because there are many ways you can create this. Now, the ruby matrix has a grain size which is much, much bigger than 100 nanometers. So, they are not in nanoscale. Well, to give you examples, zirconia particle embedded in aluminum matrix, although it is not well ordered, you can see that, but they are there at different sizes also. It is possible to create such a kind of structures. Okay, but zirconia aluminum have solid solubility, so therefore, you have to be worried about diffusion barrier. That is something which is not easy to design. Well, you know also you can see composite fiber or consists of polymer bound carbon nanotubes. You are putting carbon nanotubes in polymer matrix in a very styrene or something and put it. That is also a nano composite polymeric, poly, that means nanotubes in a polymer matrix. This is also taken from Dieter Bolat. Well, so in a nutshell before I stop this part of my lecture, so you can have a matrix whose 3D matrix, whose gain size is much, much bigger than 100 nanometers. They can be even microns, 5 to 10 or 20 microns, 50 microns, within which you can put near reinforcements. Like when you can put nanoparticles, you can put nanofibers, nanowires, nanotubes, or you can have laminates, or you can have sandwiches, you have seen that. And you know, these are the examples of real world. These are the, uh, you know, copper, aluminum copper alloys, okay, in which nano precipitates can be needle separate or plate separate precipitates are formed or you can also have particles also depending on the heat treatment which you provide, correct. So, that is how you can create these 3D nanostructure materials. So, 
in a nutshell, you know, I talked about a lot of things on 2D and 3D. How to create different 2D and 3D nanomaterials in case of thin films on the substrate and in case of nanocomposites. Please study well, look at the books, and even think about it. You should be, when you, once you listen to the lecture, listen it bits and pieces so that it goes into your mind and you don't forget it in your lifetime. That's what you should do it. Well, you know, that's, that's my first part of my lecture. So, uh, I have discussed about different types of nanomaterials. So, basic geometry is nanoparticles, nanowires, nanorods, nanotubes, thin planes on substrates, right? Then you can create different kinds of structures, 2D or 3D, from these structures. That's what I discussed. You can see that these connections from here to there and then here to there. Okay? That's possible actually. Well, in, in, in a nutshell, if you want to talk about class and dimensionality, class is distinct nanoparticles like smoke, diesel fumes, nano rods, tubes, examples carbon nanotubes, nano thin flames, foil, like gilding oil, foil or something which glitterates. Class 2 is surface nano feature materials like thermocrystalline thin flames nano crystalline interconnects or nano surface layers and class 3 is a bulk things. You can create nano crystalline materials like nano particles composites, nano tube inputs composites or multi layer structures. Okay. So, these are we can divide 2D, 2D, 1D and 0D. Right? You can create that using those things you can create this kind of 3D or bulk nano structure materials. So, that is my part 1 of lecture today. And uh, next uh, 20 minutes or so, I am going to talk about something new, right? Let us see that. As you know, this is something which you should understand. Why nanometers are so important? Because of high surface area to volume ratio. That I have discussed to you again and again. Now, we have to put it in perspective, right? So, that you understand it and do not forget it. Well, this is something I should share with you. I have seen in my life here, most of the students actually, not to fall, okay, only for some of the students. They just listen to the lectures, take the exam, and then in the next semester, they forget everything. Nothing remains in their brain. They erase out everything. Very interesting capabilities they have. It is very difficult to forget something, right, in life, which you are new learning. But I don't know, this new breed of students, they seem to be mastering the art of erasing out from their brain. So, they have something like a memory in your memory stick. You just copy it and after some time you completely format it, right. That's possible, which I didn't know. So, that means human are slowly going to the machine-like behavior. That's funny, right. If human become computer, then the senses will be lost. Well, let us not discuss much about that. So, uh, this lecture is taken from some uh, many of these books from outside this, but is there uh, from the Bola, Dieter Bola's book, chapter 2 I think, in Dieter Bola's books talks about uh, these aspects. Surface is nanomaterials, chapter book. You know, nanomaterials, surface basically form a sharp interface between a particle and the outside world or between a particle and the matrix. Now, you understand what a matrix, right? I have already told you about the matrix. So, this in surface is basically a sharp interface between a particle and the surrounding matrix, a surrounding atmosphere rather, or interface between a precipitated phase and a parent phase. The free surfaces in case of particles materials again boundaries okay, in the ball material. Nanomaterials have large surfaces, correct, as you know. The fact which can be demonstrated very easily. You know, if you talk about spherical particles, okay, the volume to say the what's that ratio between surface area to volume, okay, this is something in a area to volume ratio is 6 divided by d. You may ask, how do we get it? Very simple. For a sphere, volume is 4 third pi r q, right? And uh, a is 4 pi r square. 
So, if you clearly see, it's basically A by V. If I consider these two relationships, A by V, okay, is equal to C by R. That is nothing but six by D. So that means it is inversely proportional to diameter of the particles. As you decrease the particle size, diameter decreases, R increases. That's very important. But that's mathematical, right? That means we are talking about very thin layer of sur surface, which is not correct. Okay, practically, every material has a thin surface layer. How do you define that surface layer? Well, it is these atoms sitting on the surface which are interacting with the surroundings. Bulk atoms are not interested, they are slipping, okay, just like many of you sleep in the clubs. So, they are not interested to interact. Yes, they remain cool, calm. Only that layer of band of atoms, they interact with the surrounding matters. So now, that's such a finite dimension, right? Let us suppose that dimension is thickness is T, right? Let us suppose that, okay? So what I do is, I consider a spherical nanoparticle, right? Let us suppose this is a dimension of D diameter of D. Now I am talking, the surface, let us consider surface is not a mathematical entity. Surface is a physical entity, that is obvious and that means, that means in this nanoparticle, if I draw again this picture, okay, this does not look good, right? Let us erase it out. Okay, so I just draw it again. Much better way. Eh? So, now I am saying that there is a finite thickness of the surface layer. Let us suppose this is a thickness T, right, and this is the center, this is the earlier diameter. So, now if I have to consider what is the number of atoms sitting, or the fraction of atoms sitting on the surface. So, I can always consider this ratio R star that is equal to d q minus d minus t q divided by d q that is equal to 1 minus d minus t divided by d q right. Now, if I this t is a variable here depending on the type of material, this T will change. Normally, T changes from 0.5 to 1.5 nanometers. That means, 0.5 is 5 Armstrong, you know 1 Armstrong, right? 1 Armstrong is 10 to the minus 10 meter, that is equal to 0.1 nanometer. And 2 about 15 Armstrong, that is okay. So, what is the lattice parameter of copper? Lattice parameter of copper is lattice parameter of copper is 3.61 Armstrong. 5 micron means almost like a two layer, close to two layers, maybe two and a, one and a half layers of copper. And 15 Armstrong means almost like a four layers of copper. That is not much, right? If I have a copper nanoparticle, it is expected the four, two to three, the two to four layers will be interacting with the surrounding matrix. It is, it is logically correct. So now, if I plug in these values of this T from 0.5 to 1.5 nanometers, what do I get? Let us go back to that uh, plot. So now, thickness of the surface layer as a function of this ratio R star, what have I done it just now, surface layer to volume. As you see, if it is 0.5 nanometers thickness, then this as a function of particle size, this is how these things changes. And you can clearly see as about 5 nanometers or less, the huge rise of this ratio. That means, then the surface effects are significantly large compared to bulk. And below about say about 50 nanometers, higher than 50 nanometers, these effects are not large. What happens if I increase the size? of this thickness, then the effect 
is pretty strong, something about say 15 nanometers. You can see that very pretty strong. It's about 35 percent to 40 percent atoms are sitting on the surface. Only when it goes down to about say 30, 40 nanometers, then you don't see. So that is the effect you understand. You have to remember. The thicker the surface layer, larger will the particle size, on which this effect will be prevalent. Right. So thinner the layers, less will be. The lower the, the, the size of the particles on which this effect will be significantly felt. That is the thing which I wanted to tell you. So most of the mathematical treatment do not consider these aspects. They always consider a finite size, whether that means a sharp interface kind of things. There is only one layer of surface atoms, then surface, then the surrounding comes into picture. That is absurd and that is absolutely not correct at all. So please understand that in all your mathematical treatments which you will be doing, this must be built in. But unfortunately, I may not be able to do all the analysis like this way, thickness of consideration, but you can do it at your home task or homework assignments, something like that. So let us come back to it now. So what is the importance of the surface then? That you understood, right? It serves as an interface of all kind of interactions, reactions, interactions, everything, right? It serves as a gatekeeper of energy, transfer, material exchange, and also all kinds of formations. Surface is nothing but a two-dimensional phenomenon, right? Surface area is correlates with function. Surface is extremely important for living things, right? Huh, very important, right? You inhale some coronavirus, you get infected, right? Surface to volume ratio is especially important in catalysis and nucleation. Once happen, the surface, surface becomes materials, when the material becomes very small, okay? That is the question we are dealing with. Simple diffusion in cells is hindered if the surface to volume ratio decreases. Cells become larger. Okay. Why we are not big gigantic cells rather than consider millions of micron sized cells? That is the question many people ask. Why can't you have one gigantic cell? Everything is controlled. No, it is basically micron sized cells assembled properly to make a human being. At the macroscopic scale, why do trees have so many leaves? An integrated root system networks. Why our lungs filled with alveoli, our intestines are microvilli, our blood systems are with capillaries. Why do nanomaterials integral to nature's design? That is the very fundamental questions one needs to know. Okay, they are integral to the fundamental design concepts. They are, cannot be removed. So in each of these things, we have nano structures built in. That's main idea is to increase the surface area to volume ratio. Well, when we refer to single surface, singular surface area, we refer to a surface area of a single line of particles, right? As you know, area is a function of all s square, d square, x square, r square. Volume is a function of cubed, like r cube, d cube, x cube. And now, obviously, this will be one by d the surface area to volume ratio. In other words, the dimension appears as small as small limits, the surface to volume ratio scales as inverse of a dimension. These people know it long, long back, maybe even olden days also, 2000 years ago, people knew it very well. That's why they could create all kinds of structures in the olden days, even before Christ or maybe 3000 years ago also. Well, so let's see it, let us plot it. This is something I showed you. It is because of the surface atoms that nanomaterial display remarkable phenomenon. Surface is important in any size domain, but not in a bulk, okay, because surface area is very small in a bulk material. They do not make much difference to the property. Surface is what we just above the everything occurs. In bulk materials, most of these atoms and molecules are contained within the volume. Only a fraction, very small, less than maybe 2 percent or 3, 3 percent of the atoms sitting on the surface, they do not make much difference. In nanomaterials, it is the other way, which we have been discussing again and again. Well, so I will not talk about much to that. So I just want to show you that this, you need to do with this maths very clearly. If we consider a cube, what is the surface area to volume ratio? 6 pi A. A is the dimension of the cube. You can do it here also very easily. In a cube, okay, how many facets are there? 6, right. And in a cube, basically, 
each side has a dimension of A. So then volume of the Q is S by B. So volume of the Q is AQ. We know that. So what is the surface area of the Q? Each surface area is A square. A into A, 6. So 6 A square. So that means 6 by A. Sphere I have already done. Why are you have to do it yourselves? It's 4 by D when H is very large. Cylinder is very easy. All of you should do that. How do you do it? Cylinder? Okay. Cylinder is like this. You have a two dimension. One is the height H, other is your diameter D. Right? So, surface area volume ratio. What is the volume? Pi R square H. R is the half of the diameter, right? This is R. And what is twice pi R H? So, it's become this twice by R. Right? That's a cylinder. So, it's 2 by R. So, now you put it is 4 by D. Yes, it's not 3 by D, it's 4 by D. Okay? Or if it's R H is equal to D, then it will be 4 by H. I'm sorry about it. This you will have 2 by H. Right? So, that's you should do it for all kinds of geometry like this. You can plate, you can do it for even a cone, you can do it for many things. It's possible. Well, uh, so I think I should stop here. So, with this discussion, next class we'll talk about what is the evolution of surface energy. Okay, how actually I start with definition of surface energy, and then I'll go into the surface energy of these nanoparticles. Something I'm showing you here, you can see the surface energy also scales with one by d, right? So we'll see that actually. So this is something which you should read well and try to understand. These are new things which I'm talking about it surfaces and interfaces, surface energy, how they built in and how actually they important in nanostructure materials. Remember, these are actually generalized discussions. So they are valid for any kind of materials which you can think about it. And uh, lastly, I would like to tell you that, you know, uh, the as I am giving a video lecture to you, uh, you know, I am not asking you any questions or you are not asking me any questions, right? So the most of the lectures will be pretty packed up. So, when you see this lecture, you should see in pieces like, okay, I am trying to make it pieces, but if sometimes I may not be able to do it, you can actually see it and stop it and again come back and see it. So, that watch it. So, that it gives you a good feeling of the lecture. Thank you.